All right, everyone, I am here with Shubarna Sinha. Shubarna is a machine learning engineering leader at 23andMe. Shubarna, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Thank you for having me, Sam. Very happy to be here. Uh, I'm super excited to have you on and to dig into a little bit of what you're up to at 23andMe. Uh, to get us started, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your background and how you came to work at the intersection of machine learning and biology. Ah, so I actually had a very roundabout way <laughs> uh, into machine learning and biology. Um, my PhD was in something called electronic design automation, where we would develop algorithms uh, for um, automating semiconductor chips, actually. So that was what I did after my PhD for about eight years, working in various industry research labs. In the meantime, uh, you know, I was following some of the developments in genomics. Uh, the Human Genome Project had just concluded, um, and I was, you know, increasingly getting excited about working in in biology and applying, you know, my computational skills to biology. So I did a major pivot, and I ended up at Stanford. Um, and I was basically developing methods to analyze some of the cancer genomics data sets that had been put out by the NIH. Um, so a lot of that work was focused around drug discovery, like trying to identify um, genes or proteins that would be that would be useful targets for drugs for specific types of cancers. Um, I did that at Stanford for a while, then moved to SRI International, which is another nonprofit research institute. Um, in the meantime, an opportunity came up at 23andMe, and it seemed to basically marry my uh, skills in engineering with my interest in um, gen genomics. And um, so I basically jumped in, and I've been, um, I joined last year, and I've been there for about a year now. And, uh, nice. Yeah, so we started talking about this before the, the interview started rolling. I was trying to get a sense for what your team was focused on and where it's at in the organization and how your org was organized. Um, and we got into this, we started down the path of an interesting conversation and I said, hey, let, let's stop and let's just hit that red button and uh, do it while we're recording. Uh, so let's, let's go back there. Tell us a little bit about your team and your team's charter and uh, what your focus is and, and how you, where you fit in the process of getting a model from, you know, an idea to production. Right. So, so my team, uh, you know, we are in the, on the engineering team, but uh, we sit on the intersection of the engineering team and the data scientists. Um, and so specifically, my team's charter is basically to build a machine learning engineering platform to develop and serve uh, uh, the machine learning models that we have. Uh, our current focus is very much on the health side. Um, hopefully, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But, um, I mean, machine learning is pretty widely used within the company. We also have an ancestry product that uses machine learning. So some of the work around uh, serving these models to customers um, goes through people in my team. Um, and, um, and, you know, the way we are set up, uh, we are a very, um, like collaborative, it's, it's a very strong collaborative effort with data scientists. So, um, even though the people that directly report to me are engineers, um, I have data scientists come and work, uh, work with my engineers very closely. Um, and, um, you know, we have, uh, like our weekly meetings or like, um, sprint meetings or whatever. Everything is like mm -hmm. attended by data scientists as well as engineers. Um, and so it's a very strong collaborative effort, um, to get these models up and running. Um, the initial part of the model development is obviously done by data scientists. The yeah. methodology is figured out by them. But then um, kind of converting, kind of bringing in engineering rigor into the process like um, and uh, developing the pipeline that would actually train these models at scale and eventually serve them is all, all being done within my team. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in, in 23andMe, the infrastructure that's supporting all that and the kind of platform and tooling and those kinds of things, that's handled by another team. 
uh, that is more software engineers, or is that also handled by your team, or does it kind of depend? It's uh, it's handled by um, other teams. So there are data engineers who are actually like taking, you know. So so we sell these um, kits that actually, you know, where you where you. Uh, give you, you know, your saliva and DNA is extracted from that. So there is a lot of work that goes from like that DNA extract or like actually from kind of getting, getting the kits from customers to extracting DNA uh, to make, uh, to, you know, converting all of the data into a process or converting all of the data uh, that can be actually incorporated or used by machine learning platforms. So there's a lot of, you know, backend engineers uh, who are doing doing that part of the work. Um, and um, and also like once you know we have once we have a model and we are serving predictions, um, obviously there's a front end engineering team that is managing you know how our report how how you know the, how a user inter interacts with our website and gets these results. So that's a different different team. So we are sort of in the middle, but we work very closely with the data scientists who are building the models. Got it. And now yeah. coming from the EDA industry, um, you know, into to bio and working on building the, those bio models, um, you know, how have you made that transition? <laughs> uh, it was, it was, you know, it was an amazing amount of learning that I had to do, but I, it was, uh, I, I totally enjoyed it. So there was a time, I think this was mainly done at Stanford where, um, I would basically, I knew nothing about human biology beyond what I had read in, you know, in class 12 and, or, and this was back in India and we didn't even talk genetics at that time. Um, so I would basically read any and every paper that crossed my <laughs> path. <laughs> um, uh, the person I was working for, he's strong. He, he, he was, you know, he was a computer scientist. My, ba- my training was very much in computer science slash engineering, but he made it very clear that, you know, the only way we can have real impact is actually working with biologists and, you know, influencing uh, kind of the experiments they're doing and getting them to uh, basically test and validate some of the predictions we are making. So uh, so I, I, I was lucky to find some collaborators who were willing to work with me pretty closely. And um, so any paper that they read, I would read because I was trying to kind of get into their mindset and try to th- trying to think about what excited them about uh, any you know predictions we make uh, from the computational side. So so the initial part was you know learning a lot about cancer biology, um, then genetics in general. How how is all of this? Uh, how is all of this data analyzed? Um, and uh, how does it go from like these genotyping um, arrays into like you know numbers that we can process? So um, yeah, and and that's actually helped me here in my role at Twenty Three and Me because now I'm able to again, even though even though I'm on the engineering team, I can actually kind of talk to data scientists and have a conversation and understand what their challenges are when they're looking at certain types of data and um, things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, So one of the things we wanted to talk about was uh, your work around this um, creation and evaluation of polygenic scores. Right. Tell us a little bit about the background there. Right. Um, So this is, uh, so just to kind of explain to you why we even need polygenic scores, right? So so typically, you know, if you zoom out, uh, so what we are measuring with our genotyping arrays are basically what's called single nucleotide polymorphisms. So these are kind of alterations or variations um, in the genome. Um, and, um, and so we, so there are locations in the genome that, uh, that we measure them. That's, and we are measuring around 1.5 million locations at this point, I think. Uh, yeah, approximately that number. I don't know if the number is exact. Um, and, and so what happens is in certain types of diseases, um, or there are certain kinds of variants that are, you know, that basically increase your, that that are called Mendelian risk variants. And though if you have those variants, you are hundred percent guaranteed to have the disease. An example of that would be cystic fibrosis. So if you have certain variants in the CFTR gene, you're guaranteed to have the disease. 
Then there are certain variants which are called like um, kind of low frequency disease variants. And these these occur at, at a low frequency. Um, but if you, again, if you have the variant, you have a much, you have a greater increased probability of getting that particular disease, disease. So an example of that would be the BRCA1 gene or the BRCA1 gene for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, but in the vast majority of cases, particularly in, in diseases like heart disease, what we see is that a single variant by itself is not able to kind of, in, it does not like increase your risk for getting the disease by a significant amount. But if you look at a combination of those genes, or a combination of those variants, then, you know, it can actually increase your risk in a, in a clinically meaningful way. And so polygenic risk scores is basically, you know, taking this combination of genes and coming up with a risk score um, for that. Um, and in terms of, you know, how it's actually done, um, I, you know, so we start, it's, you know, that part is pretty kind of traditional machine learning, I would say. Uh, so we start with, uh, you know, ad identifying basically a training validation and test cohort based on the data that we have. Um, um, and, and, and sorry, and the other kind of um, other f feature that I that I forgot to mention was so this is on the input side, right? This is the genetic data. Uh, our customers also fill in survey questions, and so these survey questions are basically used to create the predictor variables. So, for example, if you take an example of, um, of this L LDL, or which is a, which is considered the bad cholesterol marker, right? So they would look at information like, what did you have any information about your LDL values, or were you ever prescribed medication for LDL, or you know, a bunch of questions like that. So those get combined, and you get basically the predictor variable. Um, and then, you know, then it's the, the normal processes of you start with cohort create, like, you know, cre identifying your training validation and test cohorts. Then um, you're doing some kind of feature selection because this is a high dimensional problem. Um, and then, you know, like um, there is there is a process where we are fitting a bunch of different models because uh, uh, because, you know, you you do want to like pick subsets of these features and see which ones of them perform well in, 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 in the validation cohorts. And I think one thing to probably mention here is we take ethnicity information into account because clearly there's a strong relationship between genetics and like ethnicity, like the same, uh, the same variant does not necessarily have the same effect on someone who's in the European population versus who's someone who's in the African American population or the Asian population. So, uh, so whatever models we fit, we make sure we evaluate them in different ethnicities. And, um, and then there's a final step of, you know, selecting the best model for each ethnicity and then kind of packaging the results in, a, in an interpretable, meaningful way to the customer, basically. So that's at a high level what happens uh, in creating a polygenic risk score. In terms of your inputs or your training data, it sounds like you're starting from a fairly refined data set, meaning you're not having to think about um, sequence alignment and identifying SNPs and um, uh, all that stuff that's done. Somebody else is doing Somebody that for us, yes. That. Okay. <laughs> right. So, yeah, because we're using genotyping analysis, genotyped arrays in general sequence analysis is not coming into the picture much. But, 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 yeah, definitely, you know, like from that genotyping data to a number that is 0, 1, 2, or like some, you know, some number in between is being handled by another team um, mm -hmm. within, within 23andMe. Right. Okay, so you've you uh, you have this input data and the survey data, and mm -hmm. you are the output is some dashboard or assessment tool or a report or something like that based on these polygenic scores. Um, right. And it sounds like your team's role is kind of building out that pipeline and a. a a platform That's right. a set of tools to to support that. What are some of the main challenges that come into play? 
You make oh. it sound so easy, you know, it's just <laughs> smart and no big deal. No, no, it is. Uh, well, I mean, you know, again, the initial methodology was developed by a data scientist. So they obviously had to go through a proof of concept to make sure that, you know, the method worked. Yeah. Uh, this is not my work, but, you know, just to paraphr- kind of uh, just tell what, uh, tell you some of the things they had to do. Uh, so, uh, I mean, wh- one of the kind of the biggest proof of concepts that a method works is to show that it works on a different data set, right? And so um, we had a type 2 diabetes report that we had put out, I think, sometime last year. So they we used a similar methodology and applied it to the UK biobank data. And they were able to show that, you know, th- we are able to... Um, like our um, polygenic risk score scoring methodology is identifying cl- clinically meaningful uh, groups of people, right? So there is definitely that that methodology validation that was done by that group. Um, in uh, in our case, it's an interesting question. <laughs> I, I think I'm too much in, in the nuts and bolts to pick out like specific issues, but um, I mean, definitely like, you know, take making sure that we are handling ethnicity information properly um, and uh, making sure that... Um, uh, properly in the sense of like compliance and... Uh, right, right. So, so there is... Something else. Right. So there's definitely that research compliance. We need to make sure that we are we are kind of satisfying research compliance. Then we are also GDPR, CCPA compliance. So, you know, we have to have all of our training data in, um, in, in even though we, you know, we save our training data for a little bit, it expires. So we have to have processes in place to, to kind of uh, destroy those buckets at, at a regular frequency and regenerate all of the training data as needed. Um, but in terms of like, so, so specific things around ethnicity, for example, um, so when we, f- in our training cohort, we, tr- we often make like a mixed ethnicity cohort just to give us as large a training population as possible. But on certain steps um, in, in the process, so for example, when we are doing feature selection, we run something called genome-wide association studies to get a set of set of uh, SNPs or variants that are associated with the particular disease we are interested in, significantly associated. And so all of that work has to happen in an ethnicity specific. Um, it, it has to happen in population specific populations because the po- the kind of the genetic architecture is different in different populations. So we have to be mindful about splitting out the data correctly mm-hmm. at that point. Um, and then um, you know, like when we are picking, kind of w- when we are looking at the best model for each ethnicity, we have to make sure we have a good way of picking and choosing things from different um, different group. Like you know, like one model might do very well for uh, say the European population, another model might do better for the African American population. So we need to make sure we our model kind of selection heuristic is is flexible enough to be able to kind of pick out all of these things. Um, and and um, and then, you know, I mean, then there is the usual engineering challenges, right? You have a large data set. Um, how do you kind of fit all of that into memory? And how do you, I mean, you know, anytime you can do every, do all your analysis in a single machine it's always the easiest way to go so um, there was a lot of work that my team had to do in making sure that you know every time you're doing an operation with numpy you're not like doubling the memory <laughs> and so yeah we we were like doing some pretty fine-grained memory optimizations at one point um yeah, and um, yeah, and again, you know, like making sure that we are keeping all of our training tests and validation sets are pristine. We are not mixing up individuals between different populations. And one of the things we have to be careful about is we don't put like related individuals, say, in the train. You know, you don't want say some mm-hmm. a per- person X in the training co- training pop set and like his or her cousin in the validation set right. because that would inflate our numbers. So. Yeah, so those are kind of some of the nuts and bolts we have to worry about a little bit. Uh, when the, we're doing. That last point, does, does that la- add a layer to complexity of data leakage um, that you might not otherwise have? It is, are you only looking at identified relationships 
folks are no, no, we infer relationships actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we look at, um, so there is a way to kind of infer relationships um, uh, based on kind of shared chromosomal segments. Mm -hmm. uh, so we infer those relationships. And then there's some interesting points around, you know, like if you have someone who's identified themselves to be, say, Latino, and they have a cousin who's who's European, which one of them do you keep, right? Because usually our, our um, non-European cohorts are smaller in size. You would want to retain the Latino person and probably kind of exclude the European person from the training set. So yeah, so there are these kinds of uh, finer details that we have to worry about in, when we are creating these cohorts, basically. Mm -hmm. and, and is there a, an element... Uh, around like class imbalance and the idea that these diseases occur relatively infrequently that we have to try to address? That is, it's, it's a great question. That's definitely there. I think we are still, it's that, that part of our work is still very much in progress. Uh, so it's not just class imbalance because these diseases are, are very rarely occurring. It's also, you know, thinking about this concept of age matched cohorts, because uh, it's possible that, a certain individual didn't have the disease just because they they haven't lived long enough, basically. So right. there are some of these factors we are we are building some of those things, and it's it's still a work in progress, I have to say. And, and so when you think about you know an issue like that latter one, is that something that you that you try to feed into the learning algorithm and make the learning algorithm smarter, or do you? Um, do you think about it more as like a filtering rules-based problem? Like, do you, is, is that a perspective thing? Like, oh, we, we're all, you know, end to end machine learning. We're not trying to do rules or do you have to combine both rules and, and learning? You know, I, I mean, at this point, I think we are going to, um, try to like, you know, play, you know, try to modify the ways we create our cohorts and things like that and try to stick to, kind of the machine learning pipeline we have and see if we can address those issues. But yeah, I, I, you know, I don't think we are like, you know, there's any sacrosanct rule that, oh, we're only going to do this and, you know, no rules based things mm -hmm. can come in. I'm probably not the best person to be talking about this just because I think some of those decisions will be made by our data scientists, but yeah. uh, just based on what, you know, our uh, kind of the current thinking is, um, I think there's still room for improvement in the way we do, can define our cohorts and stuff like that to address some of these class imbalance issues. Mm -hmm. right. And so this uh, this polygenic, um, I'm curious, like a, pro a project like this, how it evolves? Is it uh, a, a ongoing kind of long term effort or is it hey we have this idea for this new feature and then you kind of spin up this effort to featureize or to, to productize this one particular thing so you know that's it's a great question i think we are sort of in the middle of this process now so i joined at, around the time when this uh, you know the decision had been made that we this is a, a big enough problem space that we want to actually invest significant engineering resources and build out this platform and so, um, so, so yeah, so I think we are at this point where we have built up the platform and, we, you know, we are actually kind of um, up generating reports and serving them to customers based on this platform. Um, I think the next steps will, will be about how do we scale it up? Like, you know, if you want to create a hundred models or like a thousand models or, and if you want to kind of, how do we um, monitor these models carefully uh, in the, in the context of, Again, the health space, it's a little trickier. Um, mm -hmm. It's one thing to like, you know, I mean, it's one thing to change recommendations for like a product or like, you know, or whatever, a movie you watch. But if I'm uh, telling a customer one day that, oh, you're at high risk of developing coronary heart disease and the next time they see their report, <laughs> they're, at media, they're at typical risk, right? They are not going to like that, that yeah. the back and forthness of this whole thing. So there are some kind of interesting hard questions. So we have done some things to address it. So if if a particular consumer is at, at the boundary of like, 
being between say a typical likelihood and an increased likelihood we have we do give them a warning saying hey you know you are at the boundary and so if you regenotype again using you know say our next platform there is a chance that you might move into the a uh, different bucket basically um so um uh, yeah so you know like so some of those things have to be thought through a little bit more carefully when we are monitoring uh, when we'll be monitoring many of these models so so yeah and so you know kind of coming back to your original question uh, i think it's uh, it's this is this is definitely a big effort in the company just because uh, we see this as a big big you know this we see this as something that would be very useful to customers and um and there's a lot of work that remains to be done um in terms of how it happens i think yeah it's 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 there is initially like a proof of concept that our data scientists usually do and then at some point when it seems like big enough then that's when significant engineering resources are invested and um basically everybody jumps in um and yeah and one of the things that we try to do which i probably mentioned earlier is we make sure that the data scientists are very much in the loop when the engineers are building things out because clearly you know they have skills that we cannot replicate and vice versa so we want everyone to be in the same room <laughs> when things are being discussed sure sure uh, one of the things you said raised an interesting question for me uh, you were talking about putting the model in the production and monitoring and some of the implications there with regard to it being health oriented. Uh, you know, and thinking about models in production in like a retail setting, you know, we often talk mm-hmm. about this data drift and, you know, mm-hmm. consumer habits will change, you know, with the seasonality mm-hmm. and then something like Corona happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, biology changes on a much longer time scale. True. <laughs> you don't have to worry about data drift in that sense, or is it, is, does it occur in other ways that you still have to think about? It, it's, it's, yeah, you're right that it does. <laughs> Biology is like, you know, we better not be drifting that quickly because then <laughs> things, we are in trouble as a, as a species, right? Uh, but um, so I think the way the data drifts can happen, one is, you know, as I was saying, if a customer decides to get themselves re-genotype, like we do keep updating our genotyping assays. And if you kind of re-genotype, you know, just because of some random events that happened that day, it's possible that some of the variants that were included in the model do not give a good reading. And so that could be one reason why an individual customer's model is is not performing as well, for example. Um, another po- another reason for drift could be just the 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 population makeup of of um, our customers. I mean, we try to be very ethnicity aware in the way we are building the models, or as ethnicity aware as possible with the data we have. But um, if we have a huge influx of you know individuals from a different population, for example, it is possible that. Um, I mean, I don't think the models will get worse for the the customers that we already have, but we can definitely improve uh, the models for some other customers. And so, you know, it, it would seem kind of the right thing to do to update the models at that point for such individuals. So, so yeah, it's, it's the source of data drift is different for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. And so you've described this, this product, this feature as a platform uh, when I hear platform, it makes me curious about, you know, the underlying tech stack and all the things that go into operationalizing it. Can you talk a little mm-hmm. bit about that? Right. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So, you know, in terms of the tech stack, we are, um, I think most parts of it are pretty standard. Like, you know, we are using AWS as our compute uh, compute infrastructure. We are using like doing CI/CD with Jenkins, and you know, like app de- deployment via Flask. So all of that is sta- pretty standard for you know, like all of the machine learning workflows that are being used. Mm-hmm. I think um, w- probably some of the newer uh, f- f- kind of uh, tools that have come up that we have adopted. Uh, one of them is um, MLflow. So we are using MLflow for. Uh, basically kind of keeping track of all of our model artifacts um, 
and and also kind of using it as some form of like uh, like model versioning so the mlflow has a run id <laughs> that they create and so we use that to kind of make sure we know which mo which model was generated we save the git commits um, so we know okay this model this git commit is what is producing the model in production so that's but that's partly what we what we do um, another kind of interesting tool that we have really adopted or we are very excited about is to use Metaflow, which is this uh, toolbox from Netflix. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we really, you know, we like the fact that it's it's all in Python. It's like a Python library. So our data scientists have been very uh, kind of happy and eager to adopt it. And we really like the local, the local development story that they have, the idea that, you know, you can work on your laptop with low kind of synthetic data fixtures to to you know like uh, fine tune your algorithm as much as needed um and then that same code can be pushed into production and and you can train um, models with like real data mm -hmm. um so that's that's probably one of the more interesting things we have done in our uh, that we have like you know really adopted in our in our tech stack and we're using that mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and so in terms of like local development, actually, um, I mean, there again, I, I think the productivity increases that you get from being able to flush out bugs uh, using, you know, fast running code rather than <laughs> waiting for eight hours and then have a bug pop up. That's one, yeah. one reason we like it. We also think it's great from a data security privacy issue because, you know, like the, the fewer people that need to interact with customer code directly the better in some sense. Um, so, so yeah, so we, you know, over the last, I think, six months, we've been um, getting our data scientists working on it. Initially, there was a little bit of resistance because this idea that, oh, you need to have real data in order to train a machine learning model. But so far with like, you know, with this polygenic risk scores methodology, we've been able to create synthetic data that exercises pretty much every step in the pipeline. And um, so now they're a lot more excited about using it. Um, and um, um, yeah, and so so we'll see how that goes. But we're pretty optimistic. Synthetic data elements of that a uh, part of, does that come from Metaflow or is that something that you developed independently and maybe rolled out at the same time as you started working with Metaflow, I'm trying to understand the relationships between the relationship. So the so the, the Metaflow story, right? So they are very like I mean, we develop the synthetic data, but mm -hmm. they basically provide the capability that you know, like the same code um, um, that that you that is working in your local environment. Once you push it to production, it'll work. So it's right. kind of yes. Yeah, so we had to. Uh, they don't give the fixtures, obviously, because it's too. Um, it's impo It's impossible for them to kind of uh, <laughs> capture all of the all of that. But um, so it, it sort of happened in 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 parallel, I would say, or in, in and. Uh, but right now we have all of that set up and it's working well. I think. And um, the the work with MLflow. Did you? Is that something that started while you know while you've been there, or did did that predate you? I'm curious what you were doing before. Uh, the, you know, it, it started. The decision to use MLflow was made before I joined, but like just a little bit before I joined, as far as okay. I know. So, um, it's a good question. I I don't think we were doing anything very systematic before yeah. that. So here are all kinds of you know everything from uh, hyperparameters and spreadsheets to file names to. Right. Uh, I, I've, I've been, I've heard stories about YAML files all over the place. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I think this was really, this has really been our kind of big systematic push to try to get everything in, in kind of code as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and have a pro have an engineer, have engineering rigor and engineering process around the entire 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 flow and and i think something that and the reason i mean I, you know engineering rigor is good anyways but particularly again you know bringing it back to this i to health like you want to make sure that whatever your the models you're building are finding real 
signal and you you know it's not it's not some bug that is sitting in 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 a data scientist python notebook that nobody knew about what and so we so you know from that perspective as well like just moving everything into a rigorous engineering pipeline where you know you have processes of peer review everybody's looking at the code together and making sure that it's it's high quality and it's supposed to be doing what it's doing um again tracking every tracking all of the models that we are that we are producing tracking all of the data that uh, that was that that was used to create these models or or you know at least having knowing how the data was generated by these git by by saving these git commits and stuff i think is is critical for any machine learning workflow but particularly when you're building health models mm-hmm. yes. And do you have a sense for um, like how do you quantify the before versus the after state of having introduced all this technology? Oh, oh, interesting question. So um, I'm, I might get into trouble here, but so once upon a time, this is in the before times, I was told that it takes months. To, you know, like, so the data scientists would build a model, they would get super excited about the results, and then actually moving it from that data scientist Python notebook to like something in production would take months. Yeah. Um, and then when I joined, you know, we had sort of, um, we had productionized like the second half of the pipeline, which is the data scientists would still um, create the m- models in their environment. And then they would give us like a mo- what's called a model specification file, which had information about like what are the cohorts they used, uh, what are the genetic variants they used, um, and then we would retrain that in production and then serve it. Right. Mm-hmm. So that ho- whole process would take about like um, you know anywhere between fourteen days to a month, depending on how many mistakes were made in the model specification process. And now we are down to like less than two days, basically. So you know, someone can fix, uh, you know, pick a pick a particular disease or a p- particular phenotype they want to train a model on, and um, we have a result. I mean, forty-eight hours is actually a very pessimistic timeline. Most of the time, we can do better. So, yeah. So there's a huge um, time improvement itself in in the turnaround of these models uh, at least in the generation of these models again because we are a health report we have to still get them re- kind of reviewed by our by you know internal boards and things like that but at least if someone comes to me and says hey i want a model for um, you know disease x on um, on monday morning we should be able to turn around and give them something by wednesday afternoon to look at or mm-hmm whatever Wednesday morning to look at. Um, and then, you know, in general, it's also increased visibility of what's um, what we are creating. So we have an MLflow dashboard. Anybody can go look at the MLflow dashboard, Any like, you know, from uh, senior execs or whoever is, and they can, you know, click on <laughs> a particular link and see, oh, okay, th- this is what the performance of the model is in, in for, you know, for these different ethnicities. Okay, this looks like a good enough model to ship, so we can start the conversation around that. So, yeah, so there are some of these kind of non-quantifiable benefits as well. I think mm-hmm. um, that, awesome. yeah. Some of the things that you described in terms of the the workflow, kind of managing these model artifacts via Git, are not always, you know, comfortable known tools on the data science side you you mentioned that there was some pushback on synthetic data was that the only pushback or did you have pushback on the tools and and that kind of well i think there you know i mean there was there's always um um a pushback initially, right? When you start uh, kind of changing processes significantly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, honestly, I would say this is kind of a lack of understanding on both sides. I mean, maybe sometimes as engineers, we oversimplify the the machine learning process and say, oh, everything is, you know. That happens? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, and definitely, you know, like um, there there was definitely initially pushback around, um, the you know the need to have a pipeline that is able to train models so quickly. It's like what's the point of you know doing it so quickly? Because anyways, we have to go through 
regulatory approval or whatever. Like we have to have like internal review processes. But um, but I think again, you know, like um, when you when you see something happen this quickly and you're able to say, oh, you know, I just want to train this and see what the results look like, even if I'm not going to ship it to customers tomorrow. Um, it's it uh, it changes people. It it just it's it's like a um, it's like a delta, kind of a big shift in the way people think about it, right? Like they're like, um, okay, and this I anybody can go and look at which model is being trained, and they can get like a status update. They don't have to go find the particular data scientist who's who's building the model in their notebook. So, uh, I mean, there's pushback, but I think um, we did some organizational changes. So we had these, we call these call them pods. So we have data scientists and engineers when you know pre covid they were actually sitting next to each other so they could kind of hey kind of just ask a question very quickly uh, you know in covid times of course everything is virtual but uh, you know they're in the same meeting so we do stand up meetings and we do um, uh, like you know sprint plannings and so they're in all of those meetings and so they have clear visibility on both sides right of who's doing what and if someone makes a feature request from the data science team um it's clear you know they they know that okay there are these other things that have to happen before my feature request goes in and um from my side i try to push you know if if um, i've been you know encouraging our data scientists to go make code changes in the pipeline that we have so if they want to try a different um, modeling methodology or you know they want to change the feature selection process a little bit i say go do it yourself <laughs> i mean you know this the code you know it's it's your repository as much as much as it is the engineer's repository right so and and they've been they've been very receptive really so i you know I can't take too much credit, but I do push. <laughs> That's, awesome. That's awesome. Do you? How do you see the uh, the process evolving? Are there gaps that you're looking to fill in the pipeline? You, it sounds like you started at the kind of the back, the uh, production right. side of right. things, then you moved to experiment management. Are you going to be mm-hmm. dealing with like data platform, feature engineering, that kind of stuff next, or? Right. So there are teams that are already doing some of that. I think the kind of for us, you know, like the way we look at it, we feel we are really at kind of the beginning of what machine learning can do in terms of, um, you know, giving uh, information on health. Uh, so right now, a lot of our models primarily incorporate genetic information. But, um, you know, there is room for um, incorporating information from wearables, um, information from, you know, lab values that you have, like um, your blood report or, or like, you know, some measure of some other, whatever other reports that you can have. So, I mean, we really think we are at the beginning of this process. So this whole um, idea of how do you incorporate other kinds of data into the pipeline? How do you ingest them? How do you kind of surface them? Um, And also, you know, creating enough flexibility in the pipeline. So um, if, you know, our data scientist wants to try a deep learning model for something, they should be able to do it. Or um, if they, if they want to, be, if they want to kind of engineer features a, a different way, they should be able to do it. So it's, um, I think it's more around kind of um, increasing the, di- the different kinds of data that can be ingested by this pipeline. Of course, you know, as, as we have more customers coming in, there is the basic questions of how do you, um, how do you scale up or scale, or scale out, like wh- which, whatever the solution is. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I think there's a lot of this. I, I, I personally think we are still at the kind of the infanthood of this of this platform. So hopefully we'll be, we'll build it out more and more. So. Awesome, awesome. Well, Shubarna, thanks so much for taking the time to share with us a bit about what you're up to. Thank you very much for having me. It was great chatting. Awesome. Great, thank you.